When the train arrives here at Panath from Cardiff and stations in the Welsh Valleys, it's the end of the line, but it is only the very beginning of our journey. For a train was not always met with these buffer stops, but the track continued some four miles west to Caddickston, and today we're going to trace this phantom line, the long forgotten Panath and Barry Junction Railway. of clues to Panath's lost railway dotted about hidden alongside the everyday. Here for example on this well-trod dog walking route and cycle path is evidence of the extensive rail yard which is now the close of houses on Barclay Drive just across this hedge. Here in the brush are remnants of an ash pit and part of a 30 foot turntable structure once used to spin steam locomotives round to point in whatever desired direction. And all along this walk we'll be passing under and alongside stoical stone bridges delineating the driving trajectory of the railway and carrying still the momentum of its ghost train. The yard, including its turntable, was instated along with watering facilities and carriage sidings quite suddenly in 1883, as the almighty GWR reluctantly allowed the Taff Vale Railway's mainline passenger trains to run through their station at Queen Street in Cardiff, down here to Panath. And it was from this terminus that then sprang that onward Panath and Barry Junction Railway, west along the coast to Lavernock, Sully and then, with a little drama, to Caddickston. As we pass under these road bridges, if you look up, you can actually see the soot stains from the funnels of passing steam engines. I like that sort of thing. Here, on the green band between Sully Terrace and the back of Westbourne Road, was the site of Alberta Holt. It was opened in 1904, a late addition to the line, and one of three extra stops introduced as the increased rail links caused enough population to grow and demand to rise. Populous had Panath become since the coming of the railway that new houses had been built down towards the sea, turning it into a very desirable place to live indeed and a popular summer seaside resort. The tourism boom even led to the construction of Panath Pier in 1895, the link in other coastal destinations from across the Bristol Channel by paddle steamer. The track had not been laid with such an optimistic premise in mind, however. In fact, the origins of the railway line are steeped in petty squabbling, industrial politics and greed. You'll notice on all the bridges we pass under, these odd looking metal brackets. They would have once held ceramic insulators like this one, carrying a telegraph wire between signal boxes so that signalmen and stations could communicate and keep things running safely. Though this was designed as an insulator, it now acts as a kind of narrative capacitor, holding the very story of the railway itself, and these muddy embankments are chocked full of such useful artefacts. There were plans proposed to reopen the line as far as here in the late 80s, and I think some suggestions for a similar plan were made as recently as 2016. Panath and Cardiff had vast and important coal exporting docks, and were making huge sums of money from the booming coal trade in South Wales. Seeking to get in on the action themselves, an independent group of coal freighters decided to set up a dock and railway of their own at Barry, but the existing companies weren't going to let that happen without a fuss. 
our railway was built to thwart the Barry Docks plan. The idea being that they could block any expansion towards Penarth and Cardiff and link on to the new Barry Railway to deliver their own coal and maintain control of the trade. Trying to run passenger trains from Penarth to Caddickston though was met with an understandably petty response from the disgruntled Barry Railway Company however. For the year of 1889 they left a train of wagons across the junction blocking any traffic and forcing passengers from Penarth to walk through a series of muddy fields to reach their destination. In a strange parallel, we too have met a blockade and reached the end of any navigable footpath and will be forced to deviate from the line to continue. But such a deviation is not a dull one. With all these docks and railways and industries being developed along the coast and the towns around them expanding rapidly, a huge amount of cement was required for building. Adjacent to our line was the South Wales Portland Cement Works, the limestone for which came from Cosmaston, towards which we are now forced to walk. The cement was transported along the Penarth goods line, but the quarry and works themselves actually had their own narrow gauge railway to move the stone about. When cement production came to an end in 1969, it was a final nail in the coffin for the then dwindling railway and saw the cement works become an anonymous sprawl of housing and Cosmoston Quarry turn into landfill and lakes. Trains from the works were the last to use the railway, with passenger services being usurped by the roads following the Second World War. Penarth Station had physically been split in two, with the route to and from Cardiff totally separated from Penarth to Caddickston, with only the cement trains being allowed to pass through. It was merely the summertime popularity of places like here, Lavernock, that kept passenger trains running at all, and in May 1968 the last ever passenger service left Penarth for its final journey west. November of the following year saw the last of the cement trains too, and the railway disappeared. Lavernock had been a popular tourist destination attracting day trippers by train from the moment its station opened. The half hourly service brought in hundreds, sometimes thousands of holiday makers who crowded the beach in the summertime, and the same went for the next stop at Swanbridge too. Nowadays, you might occasionally spot the odd walker or fossil hunter picking through the Triassic stones, but this beachscape is a shadow of its former self. The last stop before our line joined the Barry Railway at Biglis Junction was Sully. Here the route is harder to trace, completely buried by the town. Sully was quite a substantial station compared to the smaller platforms along this route and was another place busy with bustling tourists in its heyday. Now though, only this road sign gives any clue that it ever existed. The railway becomes harder to trace still as we walk on towards Barry, but on we must go to seek out Biglis Junction and that connection to our final destination at Caddickston. We've made it to the site of Biglis Junction. Here was that showdown between the Penarth trains and the Barry Docks wagons, and is the point where our route joins onto the Barry Docks railway onwards to Caddickston. The Barry Railway had been amalgamated into British Rail following nationalisation in 1948. Our Penarth and Barry Junction Railway too had come under new management, firstly joining the Great Western Railway as Caddickston Branch Line in 1922, and then, again by nationalisation, becoming part of British Rail.
So here we are at Journey's End, the western point of the Penarth to Barry Junction Railway or Caddickson Branch Line. <laughs> There is no direct link from Penarth Town to Barry or beyond anymore, but if you just simply put on your walking shoes, the line will still get you here eventually. The walk is easiest and most pleasant from Penarth to Cosmaston, but to trace the full distance of this lost railway, to hunt its ghost trains, is to get a sense of the great changes that have occurred to our landscape, and to get in touch with both the social and industrial heritage which has all but been forgotten, to learn the story of our town. <laughs>